Chapter 17. Dune Accused Word of the tomato throwing and Turin's accusation of Dune spread quickly through sparks. Some people believed Torin, some didn't, but no one could prove who was telling the truth. Torin said he'd seen what he'd seen in the middle of the night, when he couldn't sleep and took a walk to the field to look at the stars. Dune said he'd been home all night, sleeping, and that his father and the others in the room knew it. But people said he could he could have slipped quietly out the window, out without anyone knowing, couldn't he? He could have he could have gone down there and done his mischief and come back, and they all would have thought he'd been sleeping the whole night. At do, at noon that day, when he was, when he and the others showed up at the poor pardon's house for their midday meal. No one spoke to them. Martha let them in, and they sat down at the table, where places had been set for them as usual. Dune's father said, Good day, and Miss Poster said, How are you? And Miss Dorn and Edward Pocket looked around at the family's stony faces and tried to smile. Orny put food on the table pla- on, their, on their plates. Was it even a smaller portion than usual? And passed the plates to them. Kenny ate in tiny mouthfuls. His eyes darted nervously from face to face. Without, <clears throat> but no one spoke. Finally, Dune's father said, Excuse me, but perhaps there's been a mistake. Martha looked at him coldly. I don't believe so, she said. Perhaps you're thinking, Dune's father went on, that my son, Dune, actually did what he has been accused of. In this household, said Martha, we do not approve of wasting food. Neither do we, cried Dune. I would never do such a thing. I didn't do it. All eyes turned towards Dune. He could feel a red flush rising in his face. Really, he said, keeping his voice calm. I didn't. Who did then, said Orny. <clears throat> I don't know, said Dune. No one knows, said Miss Poster in her firmest voice. Certainly, we aren't going to believe the word of one unhappy little boy against the word of this young man, who has proved himself so outstanding. Why not, said Martha. Torrin Crane is a decent boy, as far as I know. Don't see why you call him unhappy. All you have to do is look at him, Miss Poster said. Miss Dora nodded. I do think she's right, she murmured. Well, one of you mu- people must have done it, Martha said. Certainly none of us would have. Nothing has been proved one way or another, said Dune's father. It would be unfair to draw any conclusions. There was an uncomfortable silence. Everyone focused on eating. When it was time to leave, Kenny passed out the food parcels and he handed one to Dune. He suddenly mouthed three words, I believe you. At least one person was on his side, Dune thought. It made him feel better, but only a little. In the end, because it was one person's word against another and there was no proof either way, nothing was done. Officially, the identity of the tomato thrower remained a mystery. But the effect of all this was to make the people of Sparks and the people of Ember even more resentful and suspicious of each other than they had been before. Dune felt friendly eyes following him wherever he went. At first he tried to explain when people glared at him that way. He spoke reasonably. Why would I get up and walk all the way into a field in the middle of the night to throw tomatoes at a wall? He said, it doesn't make any sense. But people didn't seem interested in the reasons. He was he was one of them, and that meant he was strange and might do so, and might do anything. So Dune stopped trying to explain. He kept his eyes on the ground and ignored the people who mu- muttered darkly as he passed by. It wasn't just Dune who suffered from the tomato incident. It was all of the refugees from Ember. Sometimes the villagers called them names right out loud on the street. It was as if those smashed tomatoes had brought all the quietly rumbling resentments resentments out into the open. The town simmered like a pot about to boil over. One morning, Dune found a crowd gathered in the plaza when he came into town for work. Both Sparks people and Ember people were clustered together looking at something. He edged between them to see what it was. Across the pavement, someone had scrawled a message. It looked as if it had been written in mud. The sloppy, runny letter said, They must go. The crowd stared at it silently. A few of the villagers seemed embarrassed. They looked sideways at Embrites and shook their heads. Mean, someone muttered. 
But others scold, scold. One man, noticing Dun, glared at him so angrily that Dun felt as if he'd been punched in the stomach. This message was there before, of, before because of him. He knew it. He put his head down and hurried away. At the hotel that night, people were upset. They clustered in buzzing groups out by the front steps, talking about the words painted on the plaza. Dun saw Tick striding among them, speaking with everyone. His face flushed and his eyes glittered, glittering. When he came toward Dune, he paused. They turned against us, he said. I knew they would. We mustn't stand for it. And he plunged back into the crowd. A day passed and then another. Then the, the sun blazed down, but Dune felt as if darkness had invaded him. Protests and questions raged through his mind. Why had Torrent pointed at him? Was it just at random? Or had he singled him out for some reason? Why did Chugger believe Torin and not believe him? Who had written the muddy message on the bricks of the plaza? Lena did not return and this added to Dune's gl glumness. According to the note she'd left Miss Myrtle, she, w she should have been back by now from wherever she'd gone. Dune's feelings about her were divided between worry and anger. He tried not to think about her since there was nothing he could do. Whenever he had a free moment, he holed up a book with a book and tried to forget about what was happening in the village. Edward Pocket brought him a steady supply. Edward was obsessed with his job. Every now and then, Dune would ask him how it was going, and Edward would get a feverish look in his eyes and say, Ah, uh, it goes by inches, young Dune, by millimeters. I've done this much. He held his thumb and forefinger a in it a tiny distance apart, and this much remains to be done. He stretched his arms as far apart as they would go. It's a gargantuan task, I press forward, but will I finish in my lifetime? It is doubtful. His fingers back with dust. He often came home in the evening later than the workers who went into the village, and he was so tired by then that he usually went straight to bed right after dinner, even though it was still light. Dune would hear him mumbling in his sleep inside the closet. He could make sense of only a few words. Caterpillars, Edward would say. Cathedrals, cas cattle, chemistry, Christmas. Then <clears throat> he groaned and thrashed about, banging his bony limbs against the closet door and go silent for a while. When he muttered again, he'd be on to a different letter. Hamlet, Harry Potter, Hawaii heart surgery, hippopotamus, hog farming. Dune imagined that Edward's mind was so stuffed with information by now that there wasn't room for any more, and the excess had started leaking out in the night. Sometimes Dune passed the spark school on his way to, to work in the morning. It was a small building with a wide open porch all around it, where the students often sat to do their lessons. The children of the village, there weren't very many of them, went to school only a few hours a day and only until they were 10 years old. Kenny Pardon went there. He would, ha he would wave to Dune when he saw him going by and before the trouble with the tomatoes, other children would look at Dune curiously, a few of them smiling. But the first time Dune passed the school after the tomato trouble, he saw 15 or 20 cold faces turn turned toward him. Someone shouted, Get out of here! And someone else threw a crumbled wad of paper over the porch, railing at him. He walked faster, looking straight ahead. A moment later, he heard the teacher scolding the class for rudeness, but not very sternly. The next day, as Dune and the others arrived at the pardons for lunch, Kenny peeked out from behind a corner of the house and beckoned to Dune. His eyes wide, his voice even softer and more timid than usual, he said. You know, at school yesterday, do nodded. I was sorry they yelled at you, Kenny said. They shouldn't. You didn't do it. How How do you know, said Dune, who was feeling crabby just that, then at all residents of Sparks. Maybe I did. Kenny shook his head. No, he said. I don't think so. Why not, said Dune. I can just tell, said Kenny. I can tell about people. You wouldn't. He gave Dune a quick, shy smile. Dune was touched. Kenny looked like a timid little wisp, 
but there was something strong inside him. I wish you didn't have to leave, Kenny said. Dunn smiled. We'll be here for a few more months, he said. Then what? Kenny asked. We go away and make our own town. Where? asked Kenny. Dunn shrugged. I don't know. Out in those empty places somewhere? Kenny looked down at his feet. He stood for a minute in silence. Then he said, That would be really hard. How will you get food? Grow it, I guess. Just the way you do here. But you'll be leaving in, month, in, in the month of chilling. That's the beginning of winter. You can't grow food in winter, Kenny said, looking up at Dune with his wor with worried eyes. Winter, said Dune. What's winter? You don't have winter where you came from? Kenny's eyes grew very round. You mean it's always summer there? Dune was confused and slightly alarmed by Kenny's tone. I don't know those words, that he said. Kenny stared at Dune, his face blank with surprise. Seasons, he said. There's the seasons. In summer, it's hot. In winter, it's cold. That's all right, then, said Dune, relieved. We're used to cold. But you can't grow food in the winter. It's really cold, and clouds come over the sun, and it rains. Rains? Kenny was so amazed that his mouth dropped open. He flung his arms up and wiggled his fingers like drops, sprinkling down. Rain! When water comes from the sky, and the river rises, and sometimes it floods, and the dirt turns to mud... Dune felt as if his mind had suddenly stopped. He stared at Kenny, wiggling fingers, and tried to ga grasp what he was saying. Water dropped from the sky? But people's clothes would get wet. Everyone would have to stay inside. And if they couldn't grow food, wait, he said. You mean the town's leaders know it will be winter when they leave? They know it will be cold and wet? I guess so, Kenny said. He lowered his eyes, then looked up again. Probably they mean to send food with you, he said, to get you through the winter. That must be it, he gave a small hopeful smile. That must be it, he said again, and he darted away toward the front door and went into the house. Dune followed, his vision of the future already shadowed by anxiety had just grown several shades darker. One morning a week or so later, as Dune came out of the door of room 215, he nearly bumped into Tick Hassler. Who was running a full speed down? Who was running full speed down the hall? Something's happened. Tick called to him. What? Said Dune, breaking into a run himself to keep up with Tick. I don't know. Tick said, but I heard people out in front shouting. Tick must have jumped out of bed and not taken time to do anything but throw on his clothes. Dune thought he hadn't combed his hair. He hadn't tied his shoes. He hadn't even washed his face. There were grey smudges on his neck and below his ear, and the usual. In the usually well-groomed tick, these were signs of serious alarm. Dune's heart beat faster. He took the stairs three at a time, crossed the lobby, and still followed Tig, pushed through the front door. Outside, a crowd stood in the, f in the field, staring up at the hotel. Dune ran out to join them and turned around to see what, what they were seeing. Someone has, has scrawled words on the walls of the Pioneer, tremendous black letters, rough and scratchy as if written with burnt wood. Go back to your cave, said the message over and over. Go back to your cave. Go back to your cave. The few ground floor windows that hadn't already been broken were broken now. Dune stood staring for a minute, feeling sick, and then anger rose in him. This was the work of whoever had, had slopped, sloped the mud message onto the plaza. Another ugly message, bolder this time. Around him, the others were rushing forward, shouting, staring at the scrawled words. Some of them stood silent and glum, with arms folded or hands in, their, in pockets. Others shook their fists in the air and vowed revenge. Tick was more furious than anyone, but he didn't yell. Dun watched him, weaving through the crowd, seizing one person after another by the arm, talking in a voice as sharp as a blade, but low and steady. His light blue eyes glinted like steel. It's what I thought, Tick said. This shows it. They've pretended to be kind, but their kindness isn't real. Here's what we can know from now on. They hate us. He narrowed his eyes, lowered his voice almost to a hiss, and said it again. They hate us. They want to get rid of us. Well, I'll tell you what. People all around turned toward him. They want us to leave, but I'm not leaving, are you? He scanned the crowd. No, someone said. Dune thought about what Kenny had told him. 
Winter, cold, rain. Maybe take us right, he thought. They do hate us. Do you like being called cave people, Tick cried. Do you like being told to crawl back into your cave? Angry voices, twenty, fifty, a hundred of them cried. No, no. Dune went up close to the wall of the hotel and examined the word scratch there. He pictured the people who had done it, clutching their burnt chunk of wood, riding with big angry strokes in the dark of the night. Yes, Tick was right. Hatred seethed in those jaggered letters. He felt almost as if their strokes had scraped open his skin.